Let's talk about what it means for two polygons to be congruent. It would be something like what you see on the screen now. All of their pairs of corresponding angles are congruent, and all of their pairs of corresponding sides are congruent. That would mean that the shapes are congruent. And when you have congruent shapes, you can write a congruent statement to explain which parts are congruent to which. The order of the letters in your congruent statement tells you which vertices correspond to which. So for example, if I'm looking at these two shapes right here, these two triangles, and I have this congruent statement, that tells me that A and D are corresponding. So angle A and angle D would be congruent to each other. B and E are both in the middle. So angle B and angle E are congruent to each other. And C and F are both the last letters. So angle C and angle F would be congruent to each other. You can also pair up the letters to decide which sides are congruent. A and B are the first two letters, and D and E are the first two letters, so that means that side AB is congruent to side DE. B and C are last, E and F are last, so BC is congruent to EF, and A and C are first and last, D and F are first and last, so that means side AC and side DF correspond and therefore are congruent. So let's take a look at an example where everything on the diagrams have been labeled for us so we can identify which pairs of angles are congruent, which pairs of sides are congruent, and use that information to write a congruent statement. Looking at this diagram, I see two angles that have one arc, that would be angle R and angle T. Since they have matching congruence marks, that means they're congruent. Likewise, angle K is congruent to angle B because they both have two congruence marks, and angle G is congruent to angle Z because they both have three congruence marks. We can do something similar for their side lengths. Side KG has one congruence mark, and so does side BZ, so those must be congruent sides. Likewise, side RG and side ZT both have two congruence marks, so they're congruent, and RK and BT have three, so they're congruent as well. When you name a triangle, you can write the three letters from the triangle's vertices in whatever order you want to. So if you wanted to call the first triangle, the green one, triangle RKG, that's totally fine. You could also call it RGK, you could also call it KGR, you could call it a whole bunch of different things. But whatever you decide to name the first triangle, you have to name the second triangle in a corresponding order. So if I decide to call the first triangle, the green one, triangle RKG, I have to call the second triangle, triangle TBZ. R had one congruence mark, K has two congruence marks, and G has three congruence marks. So I basically just went in order of the congruence marks to name my first triangle. But I have to put the letters in the same order for the second triangle. So one congruence mark, two congruence marks, three congruence marks, it would have to be triangle TBZ. In our next example, we have an unlabeled diagram, but we're told that triangle CMS is congruent to triangle HVL. We're given a congruent statement. We can use this congruent statement to identify which pairs of angles are congruent and which pairs of sides are congruent. Since C and H are the first letters in each triangle's name, I can conclude that angle C must be congruent to angle H. M and V are in the middle, so angle M is congruent to angle V and angle S is congruent to angle L because those are the last letters in each triangle's name. You'll notice for that whole process, I didn't look at the diagram once. Especially because looking at this diagram, they're all acute angles, it's pretty hard to differentiate between which angles are actually congruent to which just by eyeballing it. And that would be assuming that our triangle was drawn to scale, and you don't always know that it is. So the diagram here, since it's unlabeled, really isn't your source of information. It's all about the congruence statement. We can also use the congruent statement to identify which pairs of sides are congruent. C, M are the first two letters, and H, V are the first two letters, so those two sides must be congruent. M and S are the last two letters, V and L are the last two letters, so those sides must be congruent. And C and S are the first and last letters, and H and L are the first and last letters, so those two sides must be congruent. We can also use this congruence statement to help us identify missing angle measures and missing side lengths. For example, if I knew that angle C measured 51 degrees, 
then angle H must also be 51 degrees because C and H are the first two letters in each triangle's name. That means they correspond. And since the triangles are congruent, their corresponding angles are congruent. So if C and H are congruent, then they must have the same measure. So angle H measures 51 degrees as well. If I knew that side VH was 18 centimeters long, then I could conclude that side MC is also 18 centimeters long. V and H are the first two letters in the second triangle's name, and M and C are the first two letters of the first triangle's name. That means that those two sides correspond, and since the triangles are congruent, their corresponding sides are congruent as well. So if VH was 18, then MC must be 18 as well. Sometimes you'll have to use algebra to figure out this kind of a problem. For example, if I told you that MS equals 10x minus 7, and VL equals 6x plus 1, we could calculate the value of x because M and S are the last two letters, V and L are the last two letters, these are corresponding sides. Since they're corresponding sides of congruent triangles, I know that they're congruent, and therefore I can set them equal to each other. And then it's just a matter of solving. We've solved so many equations that look like this so far this year. The answer ends up being 2. All right, let's put it all together for this problem. In this case, we have quadrilaterals instead of triangles, but the properties of congruent statements are still the same. The order of the letters in each shape's name tell you what corresponds to what. So let's just start at the beginning. Let's solve for A. A is part of the measure of angle J. J is the first letter in the second quadrilateral's name. And M is the first letter in the first quadrilateral's name. Angle M is 112 degrees. So since I know that angle J is congruent to angle M because they're corresponding letters in each of the quadrilateral's names, I can set their two variable expressions equal to each other. 7A equals 112, therefore A must be 16 degrees. Okay, let's solve for B. Where is B at? Oh, here it is. It's on side YF. Y and F are the last two letters of the first quadrilateral's name, and P and X are the last two letters of the second quadrilateral's name. So that means that those two sides correspond and therefore are congruent to each other. Since they're congruent, I can set their lengths equal to each other. So I can say that 3B equals 39, and that would mean that B equals 13 meters. Let's solve for C. It's right here. It's on angle F. F is the third letter in the first quadrilateral's name, and X is the third letter in the second quadrilateral's name. So F and X correspond. X is 75 degrees, and F was 3C, so I can say that 3C equals 75. So C equals 25 degrees. And let's solve for D. D is on side JP. J and P are the first and last letters in the second quadrilateral's name. M and Y are the first and last letters in the first quadrilateral's name. So that means that JP and MY are corresponding and therefore congruent. JP is 5D plus 2 meters. MY is 42 meters. So I can set those two things equal and solve. So D must be 8 meters. And that's the basics of what you need to know about congruent polygons. In the next part of this lesson, we're going to discuss triangles in particular and some shortcuts that we can use to show that two triangles are congruent to each other.